Good morning. Uh, good morning, dear uh, participants of the uh, uh, Baltic Yearbook of International Law uh, seminar, um, and uh, which is organized uh, uh, together with uh, uh, the Riga Graduate School of Law, where the uh, editorial office of the Baltic Yearbook of International Law um, uh, is, is uh, operating. Now, today <clears throat> uh, we are proposing uh, a seminar, uh, Russia's War in Ukraine uh, and the Baltic States. And uh, the seminar is uh, uh, offered and reflections uh, will be carried out by, uh, uh, well, uh, first of all, the uh, members uh, of the uh, editorial board, uh, of the Baltic Yearbook, uh, the, uh, the, the scholars from uh, all three uh, Baltic states, uh, uh, as well as um, uh, some of the authors uh, who have published uh, their research um, in, the, in the Baltic Yearbook of International Law. Um, I'm very happy uh, to be able uh, to um, um, chair uh, this uh, seminar and to lead uh, our uh, analysis on uh, various aspects of international law pertinent uh, to the war that the Russian Federation waged uh, uh, against uh, Ukraine, and also to see uh, what comparisons uh, are available there from uh, the experience uh, of uh, uh, the Baltic states. Now, I'm very happy at this, this stage um, uh, on, the bar, on behalf of the uh, uh, editors-in-chief of the Baltic Yearbook, uh, myself uh, and professors uh, Lauri Mokso and, and Dainius Jalimas to uh, introduce to you uh, the speakers of uh, today's uh, uh, seminar. Now, uh, indeed, uh, uh, the first speaker, uh, uh, the, the chair of the first panel, will be Professor uh, Daniel Jalimus, uh, Dean of the Law Faculty of uh, Vitautas uh, Magnus uh, University and uh, the former president of the uh, Lithuanian Constitutional Court. Um, in the first panel, uh, we will have uh, uh, two uh, very well known experts uh, in international law, among uh, other areas of law, uh, Professor uh, Vilenas uh, Vadapalas, uh, attorney at law practicing uh, in uh, Vilnius, but also a uh, former judge of the General Court of the European Union. Uh, then uh, we have uh, Dr. Uh, René uh, Varg, uh, Associate Professor of uh, University of Tartu Law School. Um, I'm also happy to uh, introduce uh, to you Professor uh, Janis Grasses, Dean of the Faculty of Law of uh, Riga Stradini uh, University. Uh, I am also happy to uh, introduce to you Professor Lira uh, Yakulevicine, Dean of the Law Faculty, Mikolas Rameris University. So, uh, and myself, uh, Professor uh, of uh, the uh, Riga uh, Graduate School of Law, and that's the capacity in which uh, I uh, chair and organize uh, this seminar. Um, but also, uh, as you can see behind me, um, uh, also the judge uh, at the Court of uh, Justice um, at uh, this stage. Now, uh, a very warm welcome uh, to all our experts. Um, I am very happy that uh, we are enabled, uh, thanks to the digital age, to connect uh, the uh, legal thought and expertise available in all three Baltic states. Because, um, well, especially as it comes to the issue that we are going to discuss today, uh, we do have uh, a long experience and uh, as a result, lots of 
uh, research has gone into a number of issues of peace and war. Um, to start, uh, I will, um, so that all of the, uh, our audience, which is uh, um, watching us through different uh, digital uh, means, would be um, uh, with us on the same uh, uh, page, uh, as we say. Uh, let me uh, share with you uh, uh, a few points uh, that uh, the basis uh, on which we operate uh, as far as the examination of war aggression is concerned from the point of view of international law. Now, uh, today uh, we certainly look at interstate relations through the paradigm of the prohibition of the use of force and the prohibition of the threat of use of force as uh, finally in 1945, the United Nations Charter in Article 2.4 pronounced it. Uh, the Charter, uh, in fact, was um, an important point completing a certain normative process that had started already after World War I. Now, the United Nations Charter privileges peaceful settlement uh, of disputes, and it privileges multilateral uh, uh, fora for uh, solving any differences that the states may have. And we certainly are uh, in this uh, paradigm of uh, international relations today. Now, it has been argued that um, unilateral interventions for humanitarian purposes might be uh, a concept uh, or something that the international co community might like to accept. However, in international law, still today, uh, any uh, uh, suggestion on unilateral intervention for humanitarian purposes remains controversial. And uh, it is, however, at least as far as I can see, difficult to reconcile with the multilateral, various multilateral mechanisms that the United Nations Charter system uh, envisages uh, for different purposes at different stages of the relations between the states. Now, it has to be, however, kept in mind, uh, especially those who are fairly new to international law, that this idea of uh, unilateral uh, humanitarian intervention has, if I may say so, moved towards uh, uh, an, another development um, that uh, the General Assembly a resolution uh, and, and captured, namely um, the, the uh, uh, concept of uh, responsibility to protect. Um, in uh, this uh, work of the United Nations that uh, within the, uh, the topic uh, responsibility to protect, the idea is that it is for the state, primarily for each state, to make sure that it is the state that protects its own uh, citizens. Now, uh, however, uh, it has also been argued uh, in international uh, diplomatic exchanges within the United Nations, as well as in international law writing, that um, today uh, the uh, humanity cannot really stand idle if the state cannot uh, implement its primary task to protect its own citizens. And if the citizens are um, due to civil wars or due to mismanagement of the state, 
uh, suffering, or the government rather, suffering major uh, uh, violations of um, human rights. And so um, there, uh, the international community all together uh, might uh, uh, need to step in. Now, responsibility to protect, of course, emerged following uh, the, the total failure of the United Nations and the international community to avoid Rwanda genocide. That is uh, where the consciousness of the mankind uh, was, was, was uh, really triggered and uh, the United Nations uh, uh, General Assembly uh, tried to conceive of applicable legal frames to avoid uh, such uh, dramatic uh, uh, violations of international law, international human rights law, um, as well as humanitarian law in the future. It is in this context um, that we talk about uh, responsibility uh, to protect. Now that brings me to uh, my, my, my final point. Uh, we, uh, we know it uh, indeed very well that the states uh, across the planet are very different. Now, we can't claim uh, that uh, the majority of states would be democratic or would uh, have as the main value in their functioning the protection of rule of law. Um, we uh, uh, do know that uh, there are many states that do not comply even with the existing uh, international obligations in, for example, in one of the uh, very important fields of uh, international law, which sort of uh, uh, attempts to set some rules uh, when it comes to the prohibition of the uh, nuclear weapons for most of the states uh, with only uh, a, a few exceptions. However, there are uh, states that do not comply with uh, these rules. Now, um, the fact that uh, due to uh, internal problems, due to absence of accountability of the governments uh, within the domestic law, which uh, generates oftentimes, as we have seen, uh, risks to the international community, and which uh, actually, as we speak, uh, is uh, one of the reasons why uh, 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 there is uh, a threat to uh, the independence uh, to, uh, of, of uh, Ukraine, Ukraine, and not only. So how, do, how does international law, how do we uh, as uh, mankind um, uh, deal with, uh, well, these facts on the ground that uh, governments are different in their accountability is also very different uh, to their own citizens. And that not only jeopardizes the rights of these citizens, but it jeopardizes uh, uh, peace and, and, and the uh, sustainability of, uh, of uh, all, uh, oftentimes all man mankind. So how do we really deal with that? And uh, the real question is, you know, what uh, role uh, international law plays uh, uh, in uh, this uh, broader picture, indeed, um, as I uh, describe it. Now, some of it uh, will come out in uh, some of the answers or elements of the answers will come out in our seminar. Um, I would say uh, I have uh, come up with maybe uh, uh, indeed uh, four main uh, stands of how mankind uh, has developed uh, relevant instruments to deal with these risks and to deal with real threats that have emerged. We are still uh, maintaining that uh, the answer should be multilateral and should be united to risks posed, in, posed internally and externally. Uh, we are uh, now, uh, as, as we see, uh, there has been a, a real attempt to isolate uh, aggressor 
So isolation is uh, another uh, uh, method uh, that indeed has emerged. And also if you look at uh, some other states, uh, such as, uh, for example, North Korea and some others, uh, you have uh, the third uh, road uh, that uh, international law process and practice have privileged is indeed strengthening international accountability of states, but also those in charge uh, of various decisions leading to violations. And sort of international accountability, which also extends to strengthening the uh, 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 the, the responsibility, uh, individual criminal responsibility for the crimes committed. I mean, this is broadly the, pri the privileged sort of directions uh, in which uh, international diplomacy uh, has, has worked um, now uh, when, when facing uh, Russia's aggression, but also before. And it is uh, what uh, international law um, also uh, as a legal system uh, privileges uh, when it comes to threats or, or blatant uh, violations of international peace. Now, um, this is uh, a very broad picture of where we are. And uh, with uh, this, uh, uh, I will, I'm happy to pass uh, the floor to the chair uh, of the uh, first uh, panel. And uh, uh, just to uh, emphasize that what we will try probably to um, find a more detailed uh, elements of the answer. Uh, do we have more consolidated elements um, within this broader picture of international law? Um, do we have more consolidated elements to uh, uh, address uh, indeed uh, the violations uh, committed uh, by the Russian uh, Federation? as we uh, speak, unfortunately. And so Professor Jalimus, uh, it is my pleasure uh, to give you the floor to take over the first panel. Thank you. Thank you, uh, just a moment. Thank you uh, very much, dear uh, Professor Zimele. Uh, indeed, I am honored to start this uh, first panel, uh, which I think it's very important, of course. Uh, at least according to the title, uh, it is not uh, going to be addressed uh, for uh, our possible responses. Uh, what uh, does international law and international community uh, can suggest uh, in order to uh, respond to the challenges posed by, uh, posed by uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine? Uh, but um, uh, uh, I, I see the task of, uh, of our uh, panel, uh, let's say, to go deeper into details uh, uh, regarding qualification of the actions of the Russian Federation. And especially, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, no state uh, usually acknowledges uh, committing international uh, crimes or any other international uh, uh, violations of international law. And uh, Russia, I think, uh, is also uh, trying to uh, use certain arguments uh, how to justify uh, its aggression. Uh, it's not even uh, aggression, according to Russia, of course. It's not even war, but it's a sort of special uh, military operation. And uh, therefore, I, I see really very important for our panel to, to examine uh, whether uh, indeed uh, Russia has no uh, arguments to justify its actions against Ukraine and uh, what arguments actually it can raise and uh, how to, again, to find responses uh, to them. Uh, although sometimes, you know, I am really uh, quite, uh, how to say, in doubt whether uh, what I said, uh, that uh, usually no state uh, acknowledges committing crimes, but uh, sometimes looking to uh, Russia's, uh, uh, I mean, uh, declaration statements of official persons even, uh, sometimes uh, we can find even uh, acknowledging of committing crimes, uh, for example, then uh, quite uh, 
uh, I mean, officials who can be treated uh, top officials, openly uh, declares the aim to destroy a certain part of Ukrainian population uh, who considers or who dares to be Ukrainians, not Russians. So, uh, but anyway, uh, we know that uh, Russia uh, stated about uh, certain uh, arguments and uh, certain uh, how to say uh, certain um, uh, justifications uh, were presented uh, both publicly and in the United Nations, and therefore uh, it's really uh, a pleasure to introduce uh, our speakers. Uh, first of all, the first speaker, uh, I think, uh, Professor Zimel already introduced uh, all uh, of our speakers. Uh, I wouldn't add here. Uh, uh, a lot, but uh, in, by introducing uh, Professor Vilena Svadapalas, uh, I would add that uh, he really, first of all, uh, he's uh, the teacher of all the current generation of international lawyers in, in, in Lithuania, but uh, the second and not less important uh, that uh, he really took part in, uh, I think, in both very important negotiations, delegations, with Russia uh, on uh, the conclusion uh, of uh, the treaty on in interstate relations and as well as uh, on the withdrawal of Russian armed forces from Lithuania, therefore his experience is uh, really much appreciated and uh, the pleasure, I am passing the floor to Professor Vodopalas. His theme is uh, namely armed attack and circumstances excluding international uh, responsibility of states. Please, Professor, the floor, uh, the floor is yours. Good morning, uh, dear colleagues. Good morning, uh, dear colleague, uh, Diana Jalmos, Professor and Judge. Good morning, uh, Judge Professor Ineta Zemela. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues, my uh, topic uh, is uh, rather topic which is uh, um, could be seen as a technical in some sense. Uh, as you know, I'm sure the circumstances uh, excluding responsibility are just the same or similar in civil law and maybe in criminal law, in administrative law. But in uh, public international law, this is a very fascinating topic. I spent a lot of time in writings and also in uh, case law and uh, circumstances excluding uh, responsibility and uh, responsibility of states in general during uh, my term of service in uh, general court and also during many negotiations um i'm trying sorry first of all my uh, starting point is, of course, what there is no justification for aggression in all circumstances. It is well known. In particular, there is no justification for aggression of Russian Federation against uh, Ukraine. Taking, uh, first of all, into account definition of aggression made by uh, Assembly General of the United Nations, uh, it is clear that uh, uh, no consideration of, of whatever nature, whether uh, political, economic, military, or otherwise, may serve justification for aggression. Secondly, and it is very important, we are coming to international responsibility of states, a war of aggression is a crime against uh, international peace. This is an international crime of state. Aggression gives rise to international responsibility. And in our context, it is very important to uh, emphasize, to underline that no territorial acquisition or special advantage resulting from aggression is or shall be recognized as lawful. 
definition of uh, international responsibility of states or responsibility of states in international law, rules codified by the United Nations International Law Commission uh, on the basis of very rich, well-established case law uh, and practice uh, of international courts tribunals. And also I would like to emphasize that the uh, rules codified by uh, the ILC in uh, draft articles, I finished in 2008, uh, uh, were applied already by international courts and tribunals. So definition, definition is very clear that uh, international responsibility of states is an obligation of a uh, wrongdoing state to cease violation, to make restitution or compensation, to give satisfaction if appropriate, and the rights of state or third states to respond by countermeasures. We speak usually about sanctions, but uh, uh, countermeasures is a more general term. In uh, practice, in the case law of international courts of justice, we very often see the attempts uh, founded, well-founded or ill-founded, mostly uh, ill-founded, um, to justify uh, on allegedly existing circumstances that uh, international responsibility of a wrongdoing uh, state is uh, excluded. This is admissible in, in the founded claims. So all claims aiming at justification of any uh, violation of international obligations must be based on well-established rules of international uh, law governing uh, responsibility of states and applicable case law on uh, international courts and the tribunals. Otherwise, any justification attempt shall fail. Um, there are six uh, circumstances in uh, general international law uh, codified by, the rules are codified by the national law commissions. So first of all, consent, self-defense, countermeasures of sanctions, force majeure, distress, and necessity, six, no more, that's all. Uh, the notion of uh, armed attack, <clears throat> uh, well, uh, armed attack uh, must reach a certain degree of uh, gravity, seriousness. So when we speak about armed attack, of course, aggression is the most serious, uh, kind of uh, such kind of attacks. Of course, mere frontier incidents, etc., don't amount to armed attack. In famous case of military and paramilitary activities in and against Nicaragua uh, and uh, judgment on merits, the International Court of Justice concluded that in particular, it may be considered to be agreed that armed attack, armed attack must be understood as including not mere uh, the attack by regular armed forces across an international border, but also the sending by or on behalf of state of armed bands, gangs, uh, irregulars, or mercenaries. In our context, uh, we see very often, unfortunately, and the in Ukraine sending of Wagner troops uh, into territory of uh, of Ukraine uh, to participate in uh, this aggression. Of course, mercenaries are not uh, combatants in international humanitarian law. Well, uh, one main points of uh, the part. Uh, that uh, uh, there is a general consent that prohibition of aggression, genocide, uh, violations of human rights in general, ecocide, violations of principles of international humanitarian law, I mean, rules and customs of war, 
precludes, does not allow justification of violations and do not allow any denial of responsibility in general international law. It is clear. Consent. In my opinion, the most interesting uh, uh, circumstance uh, justifying uh, uh, the absence of uh, responsibility of state acted under consent of a uh, uh, foreign state. So according to draft articles, you see Article 20, valid consent by a state to, uh, um, to uh, uh, commission of a given act by another state precludes wrongfulness, so responsibility in principle, wrongfulness of that act in relation to form a state to the extent that uh, it remains within the limits of that consent. Now we are coming to very interesting precedents. Of course, uh, unfortunately, classical precedent, Austrian concern to Anschluss of 1938. Uh, and it was qualified by Nuremberg Tribunal. The tribunal denied that uh, Austrian consent had uh, been given, even if it had, according to the tribunal, it uh, would have been coerced and did not excuse the annexation of Sudetenland. Uh, in addition, uh, as you know, in 1938, after the Munich uh, agreement was signed, the representatives of Czechoslovakia were coerced by using against them direct force and uh, threats uh, to uh, agree for a session of the Sudetenland to Germany. So uh, legally speaking, consent for entry of foreign troops, foreign troops in our context is very uh, important. So consent for entry of foreign troops must be clear, free uh, of uh, coercion. And uh, of course, there is no implied consent. So. There is no uh, consent uh, expressed uh, expresses verbis, but somebody is saying, no, 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 we consider that there have been consent. Okay. Um, of course, in our uh, context, uh, context of uh, Ukraine, unlawful entry of foreign troops invited by a legitimate regimes, so Lukashenko, for example, in 2021, in Assad in Syria 2015, since 2015, and General Haftar Wagner mercenaries invited in 2019. Of course, I would like to underline that uh, invoking, as it is in case of Ukraine, or failed state for justification of uh, invasion without consent is clearly unlawful and uh, entails, of course, uh, international responsibility. As you know very well, there were no valid consent for entry of Red Army into Baltic states in 1940, Czechoslovakia in 1968, Afghanistan in 1979. These acts constituted intervention and aggression. For Lithuanian case, seen really Article 2 of uh, the Convention on Definition of Aggression between Lithuania and USSR. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, speaking about Ukraine, uh, the consent or invitation made by separatist government, so called government, is illegal, null, and void. So you, see, you see here uh, inter alia the EU Council decision concerning restrictive measures in response to the recognition of the government controlled areas, non government controlled areas of uh, Donetsk and Lugansk uh, of Ukraine, and ordering of Russian armed forces into uh, those areas. Self defense. Uh, it goes uh, without saying that uh, self defense justifies use of armed force. The wrongfulness of an act of state precluded, according to the International Law Commission, if the act constitutes a lawful measure of self-defense taken in conformity with charter, I underline, charter of the uh, United Nations. Well, uh, I'm convinced that uh, taking uh, into account 
stops the shell. The articles uh, to paragraph four and 51 of the charter. As a rule, as a general rule, preventive self-defense is unlawful and, uh, and cannot uh, uh, justify uh, use of force. Well, of course, in uh, uh, cases of self-defense, um, uh, here uh, there is no responsibility, no responsibility of a victim of Ukraine in our case. So this is uh, according to Article 51, you know very well, that this is a, an inherent right of individual or collective self-defense if an armed attack occurs against a member of the uh, United Nations. Uh, collective self-defense, uh, of course, a request by the state, uh, state victim of uh, alleged attack is, uh, uh, is necessary. There could be some tricks that, uh, well, they, they invited us to, to defend us, especially in case law concerning, concerning Latin America in 19th century and, uh, and, uh, and uh, in 20th century. Then, uh, uh, of course, self-defense cannot, shall not, and will not justify the violations of uh, uh, laws and customs of war, of human rights, and uh, there is no indulgency for violations. Uh, I would like also to um, underline that no justification for so-called collateral effect can justify attacks uh, against civil population and the infrastructure. It is clear. Of course, uh, in such a case, uh, self-defense, if it would be self-defense, does not preclude uh, the wrongfulness of conduct and consequently responsibility of state. Countermeasures. Countermeasures uh, uh, or a legitimate or lawful individual and collective sanctions, it could be. The, uh, according, according to Article 22, the wrongfulness of an act of state, which is non-conformity with international obligations toward another state is precluded, so it excluded responsibility, uh, uh, if and to the extent that the act constitutes a countermeasure against the later state, uh, against the wrong doing state, of course, against uh, aggression, it is, it is even more clear. Uh, sanctions, countermeasures, and the um, traditional term of uh, customs uh, and laws of war, uh, reprisals, I mean, are uh, synonyms. So they should be undertaken only against the wrongdoing state, be proportionate, and so on. So sanctions are used uh, mostly for measures uh, taken in uh, the framework of international organizations. Also, as you see, the EU sanctions on uh, Russia and Belarus in our context. Um, countermeasures uh, taken uh, or used by third state without authorization of Security Council and so on and so on. So in, outside of uh, international organizations, outside of, uh, of the European Union, uh, organization of American states and so on. So countermeasures may be taken by third state, uh, which uh, the state, third state is uh, uh, not individually injured. This is a question, but uh, uh, taking uh, into consideration and um, applying well-known case law of uh, International Court of Justice in Barcelona direction. This is a case uh, of violation of obligation of erga omnis, so towards all members of international community. So, but in case of international crime, prima facie, it should be international crime. Third state may uh, 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 make use uh, of uh, Countermeasures. Force majeure. Force majeure, this is, uh, well, you know, civil law 
civil law, traditional Roman law, and so on, this Meyer and Roman law. So ir irresistible force uh, beyond the control of the state. Well, classical examples, natural disasters, uh, disturbances, civil disturbances, for example, making materially impossible and to, uh, uh, to perform international obligations. So this is not, this is not uh, applicable uh, in our case. Uh, distress. Distress is a very special circumstance well known in uh, um, law of the sea and uh, aviation law. So violations of airspace, uh, territorial sea in catastrophic situations. Uh, aiming for saving of human lives, uh, lives on board. So the captain of aircraft or vessel, in practice, I speak about military, military vessel uh, or military aircraft. So for saving of human lives of, on board. So it could be uh, the situation justifying, for example, landing uh, or violation, land, landing on foreign foreign territory or, or violation of foreign airspace, uh, maritime space necessity. We are coming to the most dangerous, most dangerous uh, trick or uh, justification. Uh, as you see, International Law Commission, uh, this is the last, uh, the last uh, circumstance uh, justifying uh, violation or breach of uh, uh, international law. Um, very controversial. First of all, as you see, a necessity may not be invoked by a state unless. So the formula used by International Law Commission makes it very difficult to apply. Um, and uh, uh, in any case, necessity may not be invoked uh, if uh, the state has contributed to the situation of necessity. So what necessity if you are committing act of aggression or your act of aggression or armed attack, what kind of necessity? But, but um, well, uh, the problem, of course, uh, mm, armed attack cannot be uh, per definition, by definition. Um, can uh, not justify a violation uh, in necessity. Uh, the problem is that the state invoking necessity is acting as a judge in its own case. Yeah, for me, I'm a judge and, uh, and the practicing uh, attorney in international cases. Uh, it is clear that to be a judge in its own case, this is uh, nonsense. So uh, in this case, um, a state invoking necessity is deciding on our essential interests against the interest of uh, foreign states, against also a, a essential interest of foreign uh, states. So this is a, a reconcilable conflict between the essential interest of uh, uh, two states, at least. And uh, finally, uh, well, uh, military necessity, humanitarian intervention, and so on. Um, well, uh, humanitarian intervention was uh, used as a, an attempt to justify violations. You know the well-known incidents of Entebbe and so on, Entebbe Airport in Uganda. Uh, well, but uh, if somebody speaks, for example, even about this uh, incident of Entebbe, uh, Ugandan government acted uh, uh, violently, so, so attacked the, 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 the commanders sent to the airport to liberate uh, hostages. Uh, military necessity. Military necessity. Now we are speaking today about uh, armed conflict, aggression of uh, uh, Russian Federation. Of course, no military necessity invoked by aggressor in contemporary uh, international humanitarian law. So according to draft articles, as, as you see, uh, uh, even uh, humanitarian conventions 
uh, mostly in the uh, majority of cases, exclude uh, reliance of necessity on military necessity. So in armed conflict um, by belligerents. It is true that in a, a few cases, the plea of necessity was invoked to excuse military action abroad, uh, in particular in the context of claims to humanitarian intervention. But in my opinion, the Charter of United Nations and the contemporary general international law does not allow any humanitarian intervention. So we may speak uh, hours and hours, but uh, this is my deep conviction. And uh, of course, the excuse of necessity may be used in the area for the protection of environment in exceptional situations. So thank you very much for your attention. That's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you, uh, dear professor, uh, for your uh, very detailed uh, presentation on the Russia's aggression uh, against Ukraine uh, and very detailed examination of uh, the circumstances that can in, in theoretically uh, preclude the wrongfulness of internationally wrongful uh, acts. And, and practi uh, practically, practically too, of course. Yeah, but uh, this yes, is not our case. Yeah. Uh, yes, of course. And uh, uh, really, what I learned, uh, if I uh, can summarize, uh, I know that, of course, maybe. Uh, uh, we will leave it for uh, the end of this panel. But first of all, uh, really, I, I think your presentation uh, confirmed that uh, we have uh, the case of uh, classical aggression. I mean, it can be included in all the textbooks uh, illustrating what uh, is aggression, uh, what is the aggression, because uh, I think almost all uh, or maybe even all acts of aggressions, uh, uh, aggression as defined in the definition of aggression can be attributable, uh, attributable to Russia, starting, of course, to, from uh, 2014. Uh, then uh, I think uh, you also proved that uh, no circumstance uh, actually can be invoked by Russia uh, to exclude uh, its uh, responsibility in our case. And uh, finally, you also uh, reminded me uh, certain arguments, uh, you know, used, uh, that is the parallel with the Baltic states, uh, used by Russia, by contemporary Russia, I mean, starting uh, 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 approximately from 2000, uh, regarding the consent. Uh, and, you know, uh, I remember, uh, I think in, 2005, I wrote an article, uh, what is in common between the Nazi propaganda and Putin's Russia, that, that was in common, but the argument regarding the consent of the Baltic states uh, for the uh, uh, invasion. Uh, so, uh, thank you, uh, really, and uh, I think we um, maybe we are going a little bit behind the, our, uh, our agenda, but uh, with pleasure uh, when I I'm passing the floor uh, to Professor René Vark, who is a well-known expert in both uh, use at Bellum and use in Bello from uh, the Tartu University uh, Law School. And his uh, topic is uh, Road uh, to War, uh, Russia's legal arguments to justify the war uh, against uh, Ukraine, and it's really uh, logically continues uh, the line of the first uh, presentation. So please, Professor, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you. And um... I will use my 15 minutes to speak how Russia has tried to uh, uh, explain its war in, in Ukraine and how Russia has tried to use international law to justify uh, its, uh, its action. Now, um, we have all seen uh, the horrible things that have happened in, in Ukraine uh, because of this uh, war. And I have been fortunate to visit Ukraine twice uh, since the outbreak of uh, the war. And uh, I've been to, uh, to Kiev, uh, to the region north of Kiev, uh, to Kharkiv. And I've seen uh, the nature and extent uh, 
of destruction in this uh, senseless war. So it may even be strange to talk how can one justify uh, such, a, such a war. But it is interesting to see that Russia does use legal arguments, uh, does use international law uh, to justify uh, its actions. So what I will do next, um, I will uh, uh, speak uh, from the side of Russia, and then I try to counter what, uh, what Russia has said. Uh, so at, at some point, I may sound strange, but it's because I, I speak from the Russian uh, uh, side. Now, what we see in Ukraine is that uh, already months, if not years before this war began or this uh, phase of war began in February uh, 2022, Russia has actually uh, prepared uh, necessary circumstances, and then has exploited uh, the circumstances. And I will, I will explain what I mean by this. And Russia has also uh, carefully developed uh, legal arguments, both domestically and also uh, internationally. I will focus on, on uh, the arguments based on international law. And uh, for the sake of uh, uh, brevity, let's focus on uh, Putin's speech, the speech he gave uh, at the early uh, morning of uh, the 24th of uh, February, where he uh, also gave us uh, uh, information what might be uh, the legal arguments for this war from the perspective of, uh, of Russia. And um, we can see uh, three things. Uh, there is uh, a reference to collective self-defense. We find also uh, the claim that uh, it is necessary to prevent uh, genocide. And also there is a hint that uh, military operation is necessary to protect uh, Russian nationals uh, abroad. And next, I will take each uh, justification and explain a little bit uh, further. So first, collective self-defense. And that is really uh, an official position. This is a position that was communicated also to the United uh, Nations. So it's not something that we have just invented or come up with. But there is a longer story. And, um, uh, the need for collective self-defense also explains some previous uh, steps. So if you remember, on the 21st of February, Russia decided to uh, recognize uh, the independence of uh, the so-called Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. And you would think, why? Why suddenly recognize uh, these uh, republics, the ones that have already you know, technically speaking, existed since 2014. And uh, there is an explanation. As long as uh, Russia uh, considered Donetsk and Luhansk as regions of Ukraine, any interference in Donetsk and Luhansk would be interference in internal affairs of uh, Ukraine. And also, according to traditional international law, uh, regions, they cannot um, invite uh, military interference from foreign uh, states. But if uh, Russia recognizes Donetsk and Luhansk as independent states, it now means that technically speaking, uh, relations between Russia Donetsk and Luhansk are now international. They are interstate relations. And therefore, uh, Donetsk and Luhansk have more options available. Also, Russia has now more options available. So immediately after the recognition of uh, these so-called people's republics, uh, Russia concluded two treaties 
of friendship, cooperation, and mutual assistance, one with Donetsk and the other with uh, Luhansk. It is also interesting to note that Russia uh, ratified these treaties just in one day. So the whole process of uh, analyzing these treaties, the whole process in the state Duma, uh, it all took uh, less than uh, one day. So can you imagine doing this uh, back home with different uh, treaties? So it was all uh, premeditated, uh, uh, if you will. And also, uh, Putin uh, quickly uh, announced that uh, there will be some sort of peacekeepers, Russia's peacekeepers uh, to the Donbas uh, uh, region. That was on the 22nd of uh, uh, February. Of course, the United Nations and other states uh, said that that's a misuse of the term peacekeepers. But uh, as we know from history, Russia uses peacekeepers to, to interfere in different regions uh, around um, uh, Russia. Then uh, Donetsk and Luhansk also uh, submitted uh, a request for assistance. And uh, they claim that uh, there is an ongoing armed attack by Ukraine against their states, uh, an armed attack that basically uh, started in 2014. And now Donetsk and Luhansk uh, invite um, uh, Russia to intervene on their behalf. So to protect Donetsk and Luhansk from, uh, from Ukraine. And uh, indeed, uh, Putin says, in his speech that um, uh, Russia's military operation is an exercise of uh, self-defense according to Article 51 of the United Nations Charter. And um, Russia also sent uh, a notification to the Security Council as required by the same Article 51 that uh, Russia's action is uh, self-defense. Well, it's, it's a collective self-defense because Russia is uh, uh, defending Donetsk and Luhansk. So, so there is a sort of like a build-up. Uh, uh, so you, you build the narrative, you develop the circumstances, and then you exploit the circumstances by legally claiming that uh, this is uh, co collective self-defense. Of course, this is not uh, uh, plausible um, because Donetsk and Luhansk are not states. They uh, were not recognized by any other country at the time. Yes, later, uh, Syria and uh, North Korea recognized, but it's still not enough. They are not internationally recognized. The uh, General Assembly in its famous uh, uh, resolution uh, said that uh, they are not states and their recognition should be withdrawn also by, by Russia. But still, there are those who um, look these technicalities and for them uh, it sounds plausible. Uh, so it is necessary for us to, to explain how Russia uses or misuses international law to further its, uh, its uh, interests. So it's not collective self-defense, but it is a claim by, by Russia. Now, second, um, already for months uh, before the beginning of war or the current phase of the war, Russia uh, talked that there is genocide happening in Ukraine, uh, foremost in the Donbas region, but also elsewhere in, uh, in Ukraine. And at the time, you would think that why? Why would you say something like this, which is clearly not true? But again, this is uh, preparing the narrative. Uh, and um, 
then uh, in February, Putin said in his speech again that there are millions of people facing the genocide. And he said that the genocide is perpetrated by the Kiev regime and not the Ukrainian government, but the Kiev regime. Also to show that they don't think that uh, the current uh, government in Ukraine is, is uh, legitimate. And um, because um, uh, the Genocide Convention also says that states should prevent genocide, uh, now Russia makes an argument that they, they actually had to uh, intervene in order to prevent uh, this uh, horrible international uh, crime. And they, again, they draw some parallel to Kosovo. Uh, Kosovo that uh, Russia has never liked, and uh, Russia has used uh, the argument that when the West did Kosovo, we do something else. And now, again, uh, like NATO had to intervene in Kosovo, Russia has to intervene in Donetsk and Luhansk. Of course, the facts are not comparable. Uh, there is no credible evidence that genocide happened, but it makes a, an argument and, and it makes a, a good story in the eyes of, uh, of many. And also there is sort of like an indirect um, connection to the concept of responsibility to protect that is, is uh, favored in, in many, um, let's say, Western states. Um, so uh, that was the second argument uh, we found in, uh, in Putin's uh, speech. And then uh, thirdly, uh, there is a hint uh, that uh, once again, Russia is relying on uh, the concept of protection of nationals abroad. That is something that Russia has used uh, already several times. They use this in South Ossetia, Abkhazia, in Crimea. So the idea is that na Russian citizens are in danger abroad and something needs to be done. So Putin says that there are crimes committed against Russian nationals, uh, citizens, and uh, it is necessary to intervene uh, and also to prosecute the perpetrators of, uh, of these crimes. Now, this is nothing new because if we read uh, Russia's foreign policy concept and also uh, military doctrine, it foresees the possibility that Russia uses its armed forces abroad and uh, for the purpose of protecting the rights and legitimate interests of its nationals, but also compatriots. Compatriots, loosely speaking, mean uh, ethnic Russians. And um, as I said, it has already been done and uh, no surprise uh, here. Um, now, international law does know the concept of protection of nationals abroad, or, or let's say it used to know it. I think it's not, the traditional concept is no longer there. Uh, but even if we look at this traditional concept, which says that it has to be a quick in and out rescue operation, sort of, uh, what we see Russia doing, it's not this anymore. Uh, so that was the third uh, uh, justification. To conclude, um, I don't uh, see any of these uh, legal arguments uh, uh, holding, uh, but uh, uh, they make a good story. There are enough countries in the world who look from the distance and they see certain technical logic uh, in these uh, arguments and once again it is our job uh, to to explain how Russia misuses international law and to uh, sort of like dump these uh, Russia's legal arguments so uh, thank you from my side 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, dear pre uh, professor, for the excellent uh, presentation. Uh, again, uh, concentrating uh, on uh, the main, uh, I, I cannot call uh, them legal, maybe, uh, but arguments raised uh, by Russia because you uh, proved uh, uh, that it's really uh, they, they, they don't get any uh, legal ground. And also me uh, also would like to uh, remind that uh, actually the same scheme was already applied in case of annexation of Crimea, maybe not so much uh, uh, about the collective uh, self-defense, but uh, the scheme also was that in, in one or a few days, uh, the treaty, the so-called treaty uh, on accession of Crimea to the Russian Federation was ratified, uh, unfortunately, also with uh, uh, or deplorably uh, with the participation of the Russian Constitutional Court, by way, who uh, justified uh, the annexation of Crimea. And uh, the same arguments were uh, raised uh, with regard to uh, allusions to uh, responsibility to protect uh, doctrine and uh, I remember that some Russian authors of course uh, I understand that they got nothing to write anything more but uh, that uh, they uh, depicted uh, the so-called Leninopath in Ukraine as the threat to Russianness of Crimea and uh, allegedly that can uh, that could justify uh, Secession, first of all, the so-called secession of Crimea, and later, of course, uh, accession uh, to the Russian Federation. So, e even here, we can uh, see some parallels because who knows? Uh, of course, Russia can depict also the Baltic states uh, because of Leninopat or because of the uh, current removal of uh, the Soviet monuments as uh, posing the threat to. <laughs> their nationals or uh, Russianness or in, in the region. Uh, but uh, I think we will have the time uh, to discuss uh, also uh, the main issues uh, raised by you uh, at the end of, uh, of our seminar. Uh, and um, uh, uh, one more, of course, what, what can I mention? Uh, Russia is uh, also uh, uh, trying to follow blindly, although quite blindly, but the letter of, of, uh, of the Charter of the United Nations, for example, uh, but never uh, the spirit. Uh, it's also uh, the issue that can be uh, discussed. Uh, but I hope uh, at the end we will have some, some time for uh, discussions. And now uh, I'm really uh, pleased um, uh, to uh, cheer uh, this uh, panel uh, and uh, with pleasure, I, I'm passing uh, back the floor to Professor Aneta Zimile for uh, the second panel. Thank you. Thank you very much for yeah, excellent thank you. presentation. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And I join Professor Jalimas in thanking the uh, first uh, two speakers. And uh, we will have Professor Jalimas back uh, in the second uh, panel as well. Um, indeed, uh, as we move to the second panel where uh, more close uh, parallels will be drawn between uh, our own experiences in the Baltic states and uh, uh, what we now see uh, is, is going uh, on uh, um, in uh, uh, Ukraine, but it is um, really striking uh, that um, the narrative, as uh, René Varg uh, very rightly said, the, the narrative that is being uh, very, in a way, uh, uh, cleverly built uh, by the Russian Federation, um, there has also been a narrative and this same kind of approach when, uh, let's say, in 1940, the uh, occupation of the Baltic states uh, was, was carried out. Although then uh, the narrative was probably more simple due to um, a, a less elaborate uh, thinking in international relations and in international law available at that time. However, it's always been about uh, building one's narrative that justifies what, uh, what uh, the aggressor does. And so we continue uh, with that. And I'm giving immediately uh, the floor to Professor Janis Grasses, uh, the Dean of the Law Faculty 
of the uh, Stradenia University. And uh, indeed, uh, a kind of, uh, yeah, um, indeed, we, even with the sarcasm, we should say an old wine in the, in the new battle, but how new the battle is. Professor Grassis, mm -hmm. please, you have the floor. Dear colleagues, uh, thank you, first of all, Professor Zimmer, for inviting me to this outstanding workshop. And um, really, we could find a lot of parallels between what happened in the uh, Baltics in 1940 and what happened in uh, Ukraine in 2014. I will not compare, let's say, situation in uh, uh, 2022 because uh, we had no uh, full-scale war in 1940. So therefore, it's more similarities uh, between 1940 and 2014. Uh, but still, we have something similar, and of course, also something uh, different. What happened? Uh, also, if you compare, let's say, year uh, 1940 and uh, 2014 or 2022, we have to recognize that um, the doctrine and also understanding of international law is a little bit different. What was, let's say, some more than 60 years ago and just now. Uh, but I will start, uh, I will have more pictures because for uh, uh, presentation, I think it gives more, let's say, with uh, memories and um, resemblances. So you see this uh, soldier from uh, 2014, what they called the uh, little green man. So uh, this is soldier within any science of identification. What army he represents? And also, let's say, uh, you see here in the front, one soldier, but also similar soldiers on trucks of his um, uh, cars, which are going to overtake Crimea in 2014. If you just look to these some pictures, uh, what we saw in 2014. Let's say professional equipment specialist will say you immediately from which army comes with soldiers. But of course, also you see uh, some two volunteers who are just participates in these sections, uh, what happened in the uh, uh, Crimea. So uh, after this um, little green man, uh, let's say phenomenon, we start to speak about some new type of hybrid war at so and so. And uh, in some cases, also some um, experts in our country, when uh, they started to speak about so-called hybrid war, they said it's uh, difficult to understand. Um, so what means aggression in this case? Um, also, let's say there was no legal declaration of war at so-and-so. Also, let's say when you're using these soldiers without any signs of identification. But, uh, as already my colleagues from Lithuania and also Professor Zemel said, you know, the narrative is the same. And uh, nothing new has happened, what was done, let's say, in Crimea. And of course, also I will just mention that um, when we held a NATO meeting in December of 2015, it was clearly stated that if any elements of hybrid war, its reason for activating Article 5 of the NATO um, Treaty. Uh, if you speak about this declaration, uh, the wars without declarations of war. So I just find uh, one book of um, uh, British lawyer, Morris, who has calculated, let's say that in history, uh, history, let's say uh, between year 700 and 1870, 107 wars started without any kind of declaration. So it was historically like the tradition, just start and uh, not to declare. Uh, declaration of war became courtesy gesture by the states in the first and second world wars. Really, uh, during these two uh, world wars, we used this instrument that we officially declaring war and starting some uh, war against our uh, neighboring uh, country. Therefore, war without declaration, it's old methods used in the past, and it is not a new instrument in the nowadays. 
as sometimes some uh, people could uh, uh, state. If you look at uh, events in Latvia in 1940, so uh, it was some similarity what happened in Latvia in 1940 and uh, in Crimea in 2014. As you saw from his pictures before, so in case of Crimea, uh, soldiers without any signs of identification started to overtake this uh, territory. In Latvian case, we have this uh, incident, military incident on the borderline, on the checkpoint of Maslenki, in the early morning of June 15. I will show later uh, two pictures. Uh, so in this uh, incident, three border guards and two civilians were killed, and also some uh, 10 border guards and 27 civilians were taken as the hostages. So this was a warning from Soviet side that uh, we really could start this war, et cetera. Um, when we had official investigation in this case, so also, also President uh, Karl Sum at that moment, um, he said that it was done by some unknown soldiers, you know. But of course, it's hardly uh, to predict that um, some others could done uh, not from the Red Army. Now we know that uh, it was NKVD troops. And also, let's say in this case, there was no any declaration of the war between the uh, Soviet Union and the uh, Republic of, of Latvia. Uh, of course, let's say in Latvian case, after this incident, when our uh, government um, were forced to admit Soviet troops and army in Latvian territory, uh, of course, Red Army entered Latvia with any signs of, uh, uh, with full signs of identification. But let's say at that moment, in this night, uh, morning of June 15, it was done by soldiers without any signs of identification. Uh, so in case of Crimea Peninsula in 2014, then of course, uh, Suddenly, all territory of Crimea uh, Peninsula was controlled by the soldiers without any signs of belonging to some particular army. Okay, later already, Russian Federation officially recognized that it was uh, soldiers from Russian army, and they even has made this documentary movie about these events, uh, how they occupied uh, Crimea in uh, 2000. Uh, uh, 14. So here you can see some uh, picture from this border checkpoint of Mastenki after this attack uh, in June, uh, night in June 15, in 1914. And uh, I have also took one picture from uh, over the war museum. So you see these uh, three persons killed during this attack in the night uh, to June 15 in uh, 1940. And then, of course, um, if you look uh, at um, documents of international law at that moment, so you can see here um, this Hague Convention uh, from 1907. And uh, let's say in our case, what's interesting is that uh, according to definition of that moment, uh, territory is considered occupied when it's actually uh, placed under the authority of the hostile army. Of course, um, uh, unfortunately, our chief commanders did not give order uh, to resist uh, to the Red Army. Uh, but so we could still say that we could uh, have this silent occupation. So there was shooting all night uh, in June uh, uh, 15. But later, unfortunately, our uh, forces at arms were um, now made any uh, signs of resistance to uh, entering Red Army. Also, I have made, I have found one uh, case um, how Hungary were initiated to uh, become ally of the Nazi Germany. Uh, very similar uh, situation. So also they used these uh, bombers, uh, airplane bombers without any uh, signs of identification. And so um, probably it was German uh, airplanes. They bombed the Hungarian town of Kassa, now it's Kosice in, uh, in Slovakia. And uh, then the uh, Hungarian government blamed the USSR and also announced its involvement in the war on the side of the Nazi uh, Germany. 
So also, we could find a lot of these examples when such soldiers without any signs of identification are used. In this case, even uh, bombers. Uh, and uh, Hungary were involved in um, this uh, war on the side of Nazi Germany. So uh, I could say that uh, uh, Hungary has made uh, two mistakes <laughs> participate in these uh, world wars on the wrong side. As a result, they lost a lot of territories. But okay, also thanks to some uh, soldiers without identification. What was different, let's say, between Latvia and Ukraine in uh, 1940 and 2014? So, uh, Latvian army uh, did not resist to the uh, occupants in 1914. In case of Crimea, all these Ukraine military bases were overtaken by occupiers uh, before referendums and the annexation to uh, Russian Federation. So we used civilians. You saw so these in this picture, you see these local civilians who uh, together with uh, Russian soldiers uh, overtook uh, these uh, Ukrainian bases. And of course, you see from this picture that the Ukrainians were released from these military bases, they could left, uh, but um, the method was a little bit different what they had in Latvia in the 1940s. So already after occupation, uh, all Ukrainian military bases were overtaken by uh, Russian uh, troops. And then um, if you could uh, make a small summary, uh, what happened in Latvia in 1940 and uh, Ukraine in 2014. So uh, in both cases, uh, it was, uh, used with uh, uh, soldiers without any signs of identification. In Ukrainian case, it was full scale, uh, let's say occupation by such soldiers. In Latvian case, it was just attack of Maslenki uh, in uh, 1940. But of course, later already, when Latvian government were forced uh, to admit uh, Red Army, so Red Army entered um, officially Latvia already in June uh, 17. Then in both cases, we had so-called um, people government in Latvia and also in, in uh, Crimea. Uh, then we had this referendum in Ukraine um, in the presence of occupiers, uh, which of course influenced the result of such referendum. Uh, in Latvian case, so we made a new parliament. It was elected, uh, of course, uh, elections not fair and democratic. Uh, and suddenly this parliament proclaimed this Latvian Soviet Socialist Republic and then already asked for uh, uh, admission to Soviet uh, Union. Then um, uh, Ukrainian troops were overtaken before referendum. Uh, Latvian troops were incorporated later directly in that army. Uh, it's also one uh, difference when you speak about this comparison. But annexation of territories was done in both cases. So no matter what steps were done, let's say in 1940, uh, in uh, 2014, but in both cases, all uh, events happened, uh, ended with uh, annexation of uh, these uh, uh, territories. So um, it was my small overview uh, with similarities and differences between, let's say, Latvia in 1940 and Ukraine in uh, 2014, uh, mainly concerning Crimea. Maybe you will have some questions, but then probably later. Yeah, thank you very much uh, to uh, Professor Grasses. Uh, since uh, uh, this is a huge, huge uh, topic in terms of facts, in terms of their legal qualification, in terms of various consequences. And I do hope we have time uh, at the end indeed for a few questions or, or mutual uh, discussion. Uh, many thanks indeed. Uh, it gives us uh, an important perspective uh, again on, on the events and similarities and, uh, and differences. But now I would uh, uh, actually immediately give, give uh, floor uh, back to Professor uh, Dainius uh, Jalimas. And here we also enter the, the question, you know, what can be done and should be done, isn't it? So, uh, Professor Jalimas, please, you have the floor. 
thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear professor. Yes, I may ask to uh, show uh, my slides. Uh, yeah, uh, indeed, my, uh, uh, my topic is not so much about the parallels themselves, uh, but more uh, about how parallels uh, should, uh, how to say, uh, dictate certain behavior uh, for the Baltic states uh, and uh, uh, in particular on, on this issue, on the issue of a special tribunal, because it's because of parallels we should speak uh, about the need to do something to respond to uh, the atrocities uh, that uh, now are going on in uh, uh, Ukraine. And uh, even more this uh, topic, maybe it's about the parallels between uh, the uh, present Russia and uh, the Nazi Germany. But I would start uh, from the initiatives uh, where they uh, had been expressed already uh, to establish a special tribunal for the crime of aggression against Ukraine. As you can see, the first initiative uh, was um, uh, announced uh, in March of this year. Uh, it is followed by millions of signatures, by the way. Uh, it is, uh, and you see uh, here the link, you can uh, find the text actually. Uh, and uh, it is uh, well known as Gordon Brown's initiatives, uh, initiative. Uh, Gordon Brown is the former prime minister of the United Kingdom. Uh, Actually, we followed with uh, international conference in Vilnius, uh, which adopted uh, Vilnius communique, also explaining in detail uh, why do we need uh, such kind of tribunal and uh, what is the vision of, of the tribunal. And actually, uh, the initiative uh, has already uh, received some support, political support, first of all, from the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. I think the most remarkable one, the European Parliament, NATO Parliamentary Assembly, a number of governments and parliaments, of course, including uh, Ukraine and the Baltic states. And uh, you can see that uh, the Assembly of the Council, uh, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, uh, invited the Committee of Ministers to encourage uh, uh, implement the idea uh, to establish uh, by way uh, a special tribunal uh, on the basis of uh, multilateral treaty uh, between like-minded uh, states. Of course, uh, this idea can sound now a little bit fantastic, uh, not realistic, uh, but actually uh, Gordon Brown's initiative uh, followed the, the pattern or the example of 1942. It was 1942 on the 13th of January. The London Declaration was announced by nine governments in exile uh, who uh, for the first time raised the idea, uh, which was later known as the Nuremberg Tribunal. So uh, to a certain extent now uh, we are in 1942 when uh, we, you know, can speak about the possible defeat of Russia. And we can think what to do after the defeat of Russia so as to prevent any repetition of similar tragedies. Please, next slide. So, uh, as you can see, uh, and it, it has already been, um, I think, demonstrated by previous speaker, uh, speakers uh, that the war launched by Russia against Ukraine may meet almost all uh, definitions of the acts of aggression uh, enumerated in the famous General Assembly Resolution on the, on the definition of aggression. So I am not uh, going to uh, stop on that, but uh, what is also uh, very important, and it is uh, again a sort of illustrative example how right was the Nuremberg Tribunal uh, when it described the aggression, but the aggression here uh, resulted also in our, but the aggression was the reason of our uh, international crimes uh, that shake the conscience of humankind. Uh, first of all, war crimes and crimes against humanity, that is the issue uh, hardly can be disputed and even possibly amounting to genocide. And here I refer uh, to, you know, one of the first reports, uh, independent legal analysis done 
uh, by the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights uh, and New Alliance Institute for Strategy and Policy. And you can see also the link. You can find all the report. But actually, uh, more than 30 well-known experts uh, are already trying to prove that there is Russia's genocidal plan to destroy at least a part of the Ukrainian national group. And you can see, uh, and we all feel that it can be, uh, you know, the case. Uh, you can see that uh, here uh, there is a clear uh, signals of the Russian orchestrated incitement to genocide by the denial of the existence of the Ukrainian identity, Ukrainian and Belarus people, I must add also Belarus, uh, they are not perceived as, simil, uh, as separate people. They should be a part of a uh, single uh, Russian people. And uh, of course, uh, uh, when speaking about Ukrainians, uh, they, uh, uh, the Russians are uh, using terms of denazification and uh, dehumanization. I mean, they are depicted not as a people, uh, not as a human being at all. Uh, denazification, it means that everybody who uh, claims to be Ukrainian, not of Russian identity, uh, is uh, automatically uh, uh, assigned to the group of Nazis or neo-Nazis. And you uh, see also here enumerated uh, also the patterns of uh, the war. Uh, which really can be described as genocidal war because uh, of a number of numerous violations of international humanitarian law. So next slide, please. So, uh, and uh, as uh, I referred already, the Nuremberg International Military Tribunal already described that really uh, to initiate a war ag of aggression is not only international crime, but it is the supreme international crime. It is the gravest international crime because it contains uh, within itself the accumulated evil of the whole. And therefore, it is, you know, we are arguing that uh, no impunity uh, can be for the crime of aggression, just in order to safeguard the foundations of our um, common civilization, all the principles declared in the United Nations Charter and the Statute of the Council of Europe and the European Union, uh, such as the rule of law, pluralistic democracy and human uh, rights now are at stake by uh, this uh, aggression. So please, uh, uh, next slide. But unfortunately, uh, one can notice the lack of jurisdiction. Uh, over the crime uh, of aggression against Ukraine. Uh, I'm briefly here trying to describe um, uh, main international tribunals and of course ICJ, it's not the case. Maybe it will cover certain elements uh, of this aggression. I mean, uh, we, uh, we know that uh, there are two cases instituted before the International Criminal Court. Uh, previous case uh, concerning uh, possible breaches by Russia of uh, a few anti-terrorist conventions and now um, possible breach of a genocide convention uh, by uh, claiming without any ground that it is Ukraine who commits uh, genocide of the Russian-speaking population. But anyway, it, 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 it will not cover the, the whole spectrum of, uh, of aggression. Uh, the same can be said about the uh, European Court of Human Rights. Also a number of cases uh, related with, uh, with the aggression. So uh, therefore what is left with is an international, uh, international criminal court and um, international criminal court has the jurisdiction of the certain crimes uh, in respect of war crimes and, and crimes against humanity, I, I think without any dispute, uh, because uh, this jurisdiction is based on the unilateral declaration uh, of the Ukraine of Ukraine uh, of 2015, uh, which covers all uh, crimes against humanity and war crimes committed by Russia and uh, its puppet entities, uh, DNR or. Uh, LNR. Uh, uh, so therefore, it is not the question whether the International Criminal Court uh, has uh, jurisdiction uh, in respect of those crimes. Uh, 
I don't know what about genocide. Uh, it, it is quite debatable because Ukraine uh, didn't refer to genocide. And there is, uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, uh, much uh, more ground now to speak about possible possibilities to prove that genocide is also committed um, uh, in uh, Ukraine against Ukrainians. Uh, but uh, what is clear that uh, the International Criminal Court cannot have jurisdiction in respect of the crime of aggression and because of the lack of a reference in the Ukrainian declaration and because uh, of the time limits uh, since uh, at that time when Ukraine made this declaration uh, still the International Criminal Court uh, had a jurisdiction in respect of the crime of aggression. Please, the next slide. So that's why uh, it is an idea to establish uh, the special tribunal. Uh, of course, uh, 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 discussing various modes uh, for establishing of such tribunals. The most uh, likely uh, mode is um, an international treaty of like-minded states. Therefore, the Council of Europe, I mean, the parliamentary assembly is referring uh, namely uh, to this uh, pattern, and uh, I would like again to recall that it was uh, the mode how the Nuremberg Tribunal uh, was established. Uh, one more thing uh, that is, uh, should be emphasized, uh, no competition is planned, uh, no concurrence between uh, other international tribunals, uh, this tribunal uh, would have jurisdiction only in respect of a crime of aggression. Uh, with no duplication with the current jurisdiction uh, of the International Criminal uh, Court uh, in respect of crimes, uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and possibly uh, crime of uh, genocide. This jurisdiction uh, uh, would include uh, the planning, uh, preparation, initiation, and execution of the crime of aggression committed against Ukraine. And I would like to emphasize here what is uh, specifically important for the uh, Baltic states, uh, including its origins and roots, uh, and, roots and previous, uh, taking into account the previous uh let's say uh, acts of uh, aggression uh russian aggression made against um, other states uh who can be potential suspects and defendants uh, uh, as we know uh the crime of aggression is a sort of uh, privileged crime uh only the highest political and military leadership uh, responsible for decision making can be responsible uh, according to this crime, and uh, therefore, of course, um, the highest political and military leadership of Russia, but possibly also including uh, understanding here as, uh, you know, political leader, uh, part of political, first of all, uh, leadership uh, members of the Constitutional Court who, uh, uh, let's say, allowed to annex Crimea in 2014, because actually they had served purely as a uh, political tool uh, for uh, committing uh, annexation. Uh, then, of course, uh, in addition, uh, the highest political and military, uh, military leadership of the Belarus regime was acting as accomplice to uh, the crime of aggression. What is the advantage of this tribunal uh, in comparison with the International Criminal Court? It is possibly speedy establishment and investigation and even the trial. Because uh, we don't need here uh, so much evidence. I mean, evidence even clearer now from public speeches uh, of uh, Russian and Belarus political leaders and from their uh, acts, uh, adopted legal acts uh, in uh, ordering uh, to plan and uh, to execute uh, aggression against Ukraine, uh, to exterminate the Ukrainian people. Uh, so. Uh, it is much more easier to collect all the evidence required for investigation and trial for this crime. Please, uh, next uh, uh, next uh, slide. So uh, uh, now it's uh, why I consider uh, this tribunal it's very important for the Baltic states because of origins and roots of the aggression, because of the parallels uh, with the Baltic states uh because uh, we all know that uh, the aggression yes usually yes uh, it's ideological background 
and here's the possibility uh, through the international tribunal to declare incompatible with the international law and condemn the ideology uh, which is behind uh, the Russian aggression against Ukraine, uh, the so-called ideology of the Russian world or uh, Russianism, which also poses the threat to our security as well. Uh, of course, this ideology is not so consistent uh, it qu and quite a controversial mix of uh, the Soviet ideology with, uh, I don't know, with Nazi ideology, perhaps. But you can see here uh, the main points uh, which can be distinguished, of course, uh, maybe one can distinguish more or less, uh, which are important in justifying uh, aggressive policies of the Russian Federation. First of all, it is the glorification of the Soviet past, and, uh, including uh, the seizure of the Baltic states, other crimes, they are justified, they are glorified. And uh, this ideology, by the way, uh, was raised on the constitutional level, both in uh, Russia and Belarus, and it serves as a ground for a war. And you, when you see uh, red flags uh, together with the Russian uh, official flags in the occupied territory of uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, as well as rebuilding uh, monuments to Lenin or, I don't know, Russian um, uh, certain figures of the Russian Empire of the Soviet regime. Uh, it is also, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, implementation of this kind of ideology. Uh, the second point, which is also very important, that is insistence on the existence of a single Russian people. I already mentioned that according to this ideology, there is no right to independent existence uh, for Ukrainian and Belarus people. They are understood either as a single, as a part of the single Russian uh, people, or they are declared simply uh, being uh, Nazis or neo-Nazis. And uh, also as a continuation of this, uh, of this uh, uh, ideology, of this uh, point uh, is uh, declaring about the allegedly artificial nature of uh, the Ukrainian state, about the failure of the Ukrainian state. Uh, we remember how annexation of Crimea already in 2014 was uh, justified, namely by uh, the argument that allegedly at that time uh, Ukrainian uh, state disintegrated because the coup d'etat in Kyiv. Uh, so uh, here again, uh, we are uh, coming back to the point uh, that, uh, of course, looking uh, back to the history, uh, it's uh, one similarity uh, when the Soviet uh, Union invited Poland in 1939, it also before declared about uh, the failure, of, about the uh, extinction of the uh, uh, Polish state. Then uh, the next, uh, uh, also, uh, what can be mentioned, uh, we should it, uh, uh, consider themselves being an exception, uh, because uh, it is clear in a number of speeches uh, before uh, the aggression against Ukraine was launched, uh, Russian uh, leader, as well as uh, many his subordinates, uh, declared that the historical uh, Russia should be understood as the former Soviet Union. And of course, all states, uh, or according to their view, uh, that emerged in the territory of the former Soviet Union, including, of course, the Baltic states, they are sort of accidental phenomena, proxy states of the West, which should be, of course, uh, one day returned to uh, at least the Russian sphere of influence and not physically to uh, the Russian state. Then, of course, uh, the next step that, is, uh, that reminds uh, us a little bit uh, the Molotov-Ribbentrop pact. We remember when in December of the last year, uh, Russia uh, announced letters to the US and NATO leaders uh, stating about its exclusive, uh, about the zone of its exclusive interest, uh, where uh, no NATO can be allowed. NATO should withdraw their troops uh, to the lines existed uh, before 1997. Uh, and uh, that also reminds us certain parallels for, with the Baltic states. And of course, needless to say, I think that uh, these arguments are not uh, compatible with international law, where all states 
uh, yes, uh, so you have sovereignty and sovereign right to choose um, security guarantees, including collective defense alliances. And uh, uh, maybe uh, the last point I, uh, I would like uh, here uh, to uh, touch, it is a little bit broader, but it is totally anti-human and anti-democratic ideology that should be, of course, condemned universally and uh, the best way to prove a special tribunal. Uh, it is uh, directed against uh, human rights as such. Uh, it is based on the superiority of Russian people, uh, of its exclusive role uh, in defending the so-called traditional or orthodox uh, values against the rotten West. And of course, uh, when they promote uh, not only ideas of national hatred, but as well as discrimination of women, of LGBT people, uh, uh, even, uh, of course, authoritarian rule as a part of national uh, Russian tradition. So many, many other things uh, we are also included in this ideology, which is really poses threats uh, to uh, our security and which is also uh, common by way to certain political populistic forces uh, within uh, our states who are also um, against uh, non-discriminatory rules let's say uh, please uh, please the last um, uh, last slide and of course uh, idealistically uh, we need uh, one more tribunal uh, for the Lukashenko's regime. Uh, it's not our theme, therefore you can uh, see, uh, let's say, uh, uh, preconditions for this tribunal to be established, but really if we need, if we really think about uh, effective prevention and non-repetition of uh, what is happening now, uh, we should uh, really implement this not impu no impunity for international crimes. And uh, in case of Belarus, uh, it is uh, also evident that we need international efforts. Uh, and uh, I hope that the uh, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe also support uh, the idea of the second tribunal. Uh, because uh, as for Lukashenko regime, uh, there is no competent international tribunal, by the way, because Belarus is not a party to the Rome Statute and we haven't made any unilateral declaration. Uh, it is clear that uh, the current Belarusian judiciary, so-called Belarusian judiciary, is simply uh, a tool uh, of the regime in repressing the people, so it cannot deal with such a cases. And we can notice five types of crimes against humanity that can be attributable to the Lukashenko's regime uh, committed against Belarus people, including torture, imprisonment, or other uh, serious deprivation of uh, physical liberty, persecution uh, against uh, political group, I mean, those who simply don't agree with dictatorship and would like to restore uh, democratic constitutional order. Uh, it is persecution on political grounds, first of all, and even on national grounds, because we know that it can be even dangerous to speak uh, Belarusian in Belarus, then enforced disappearance and deportation of population. So that ends my presentation. And of course, I am open to all the questions. Thank you very much. Many thanks to uh, Professor uh, Jalimas. Uh, as you all uh, can uh, hear and, and see uh, the topic, the theme that we have uh, brought up today, uh, which uh, presentations uh, will be turned into articles and published in the Baltic Yearbook of International Law. But it is uh, a uh, huge uh, area with many, many aspects that uh, international law, in fact, tries to uh, explain, order, uh, conceptualize. Now, we have so far really discussed about the definitions of the crimes, the uh, responsibility of states and those taking decisions. But uh, as we know, in, in the end of the day, uh, who suffers the most? Those are the people, um, normal people, families, older people, children. Um, and today uh, they are the people uh, of uh, Ukraine who since uh, February have lived through the uh, attacks, shellings, bombings. Uh, 
the Baltic people have that uh, experience as well, and a long experience because of the 50 years of occupation that continue to generate uh, refugees or continue to generate uh, deportees uh, all throughout. Now, um, we need to talk about uh, human rights. We need to talk about the protection of civilian population. And it is therefore that I'm very happy that uh, Professor Ekolevicjene also joins us since that is her area of expertise. And uh, she will share with us uh, her analysis of probably what is the most important uh, issue right now. Please. Um, dear Madam Chair, dear colleagues, dear participants, uh, it is really a great privilege to be part of this event today. And uh, as a last speaker, I am uh, prompted to do a little bit lighter presentation than uh, of my um, uh, of speakers uh, before uh, me. And um, I will also use probably a little bit more visuals uh, to illustrate what I will be discussing. Indeed, we're coming back to the parallels, to the parallels between uh, Baltic refugees uh, in the 1940s and Ukrainian refugees uh, of uh, today. So let me start uh, with uh, some uh, numbers. And indeed, um, if we talk about the Baltic uh, refugees, uh, refugees from Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia in the 1940s, uh, we're speaking uh, based on different uh, uh, calculations, different uh, sources. We're speaking uh, uh, about uh, somewhat 300,000 uh, persons who escaped from uh, Soviet uh, aggression in, in starting from 1939 uh, to the uh, 1944. And among uh, uh, these persons, the Latvian group um, uh, counted the biggest ones, and then Estonians and Lithuanians with uh, quite smaller uh, numbers. Now, this um, group of uh, Baltic uh, refugees was, of course, part of a bigger group of so-called displaced persons. This is how these persons were uh, called um, uh, at that time. And if we compare with nowadays, displaced persons are called also uh, persons in Ukraine, but when they are still within uh, their country of origin. At that time, uh, that time refugees, they were called displaced persons. So uh, the Baltic refugees were part of a bigger group uh, around of um, 1 million uh, refugees that remained uh, uh, still displaced at the end of, of the World War uh, II. And these persons were in, in the uh, camps of uh, displaced uh, persons. Now, the, the Baltic uh, group um, of refugees had specific characteristics, which also, uh, in a way, formed uh, uh, or, or led to formation of a homogeneous uh, group of Baltic refugees. And the main, uh, of course, characteristic uh, was that they had experience um, that did not allow uh, them to repatriate as was expected from uh, all refugees uh, when the war uh, ended. So uh, in uh, 1945, for example, in Germany, there were still around 2,000 uh, Baltic refugees, and also um, uh, some others were in other uh, countries of so-called Western uh, allies. Now, if we turn to the uh, Ukrainian um, uh, Ukrainian population that was forced uh, out of Ukraine. Of course, I will not speak about uh, all those people who have been forced and have been displaced from their homes, for example, who had to move from Kharkiv to Kiev or to western part of Ukraine. I will only speak about persons who uh, had to leave uh, uh, from Ukraine who have crossed the international borders of uh, Ukraine. So right now we have around 7 million of Ukrainian refugees who have been recorded uh, uh, outside Ukraine as, as refugees. And clearly this is the largest uh, refugee flow, uh, refugee crisis since the World War II. And uh, in, in Europe, uh, first of this kind since the, the war in former Yugoslavia. Now, the Baltic uh, states at the moment uh, uh, host uh, less than 200,000 of Ukrainian uh, refugees. Um, the, the largest uh, group is in Lithuania, 62,000, uh, around 50,000 in Estonia in, in September, and uh, 30,000. 
7,000 in Latvia. Now, these numbers, again, they are very relative because uh, uh, only half of persons uh, who live from Ukraine, they register for so-called temporary protection. So the, the numbers in, in uh, the three Baltic countries might be uh, even, uh, even higher. Now, this group uh, also has uh, very specific characteristics if we compare uh, with uh, other refugees and uh, uh, because of Ukrainians' uh, proximity, so to say, to European Union, not only geographically, but from the legal perspective, um, uh, which warrants also special treatment for, for these refugees, including the uh, uh, waiver of, of uh, entry restrictions, uh, waiver of COVID requirements, uh, we, uh, waiver of visas for the 90 years, and also the uh, temporary protection regime that was for the first time uh, activated in the European Union on the basis of the Council, European Union Council decision of the 4th of uh, March. So this, these are the persons about uh, whom I am going to speak. And I will speak about a um, few highlights of the approaches comparing the parallels from the 1940s and uh, uh, the year 2022 of the reaction of states uh, towards these flows of refugees, as well as a uh, few challenges concerning, uh, considering that the time is very short for the presentation that uh, have been encountered uh, already. And uh, also to wrap up with uh, some conclusions uh, uh, about these consequences of, of, the, uh, of the war uh, uh, caused by, by Russia. So concerning the, the approaches, um, uh, both in the 40s and, and now, uh, of course, uh, the state of play of international law was very, very different then and, and now, uh, more than 70 years uh, since, since the World War II. However, there could be certain parallels that could be explored, both for the similar approaches, but also uh, highlighting the, the differences uh, of the situation from the legal perspective or an, an international law perspective. So firstly, let's look at the issue of non-repatriation. Now, those persons who have been uh, uh, still in the uh, camps of displaced persons uh, at the end of the World War II, um, uh, the, the main uh, premise was that all those persons have to repatriate. So there was nothing in international law that would, let's say, uh, prevent uh, uh, repatriation. The main principle was that they have to repatriate as the war is, is over. But then, uh, as, as I was already mentioned, Baltic refugees, they had specific characteristics as they could not uh, go back uh, uh, to the uh, uh, countries, to the Baltic uh, territories. The war was over, but uh, the Baltic countries were still occupied by the Soviet army and returning home for them would mean persecution, uh, deportation or, or even death. So the, the uh, Western allies, as they, they were called uh, allied powers, they faced with the situation that these persons could not uh, fall under the general uh, policy of, of repatriation. So they had to find some durable solutions. So the, the solution uh, of protection uh, of, of re these uh, refugees actually developed on the basis of uh, special policies adopted by some of the Western countries and plus uh, the willingness to provide uh, durable solutions by resettling them from the refugee uh, camps uh, in, in Germany and some uh, other countries. So uh, in, in, in uh, that respect, uh, the non-repatriation uh, was a, a new policy that has been enacted uh, on a ad hoc basis and was um, also placed in, in the international framework of, of then operating international organization uh, for refugees, the predecessor of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. So it was well beyond or, or well before the time when the main universal instrument, the 1951 Geneva Convention uh, on, on the status of refugees was, was adopted. Now, if we look at, at uh, nowadays, uh, uh, of course, the, the legal status of refugees is, is regulated by a universal instrument, uh, which is also in, in European region is complemented by a very extensive uh, uh, legal obligations under the European Union law. However, uh, I must say that uh, very few uh, Ukrainians actually uh, enjoy and apply under the international protection regime for the pure reason that um, this uh, uh, protection regime is meant to be uh, 
uh, determining the, the legal status of the person on individual uh, basis, which is not really uh, possible uh, even for the best uh, suited asylum systems in, in Europe with these numbers as, as I have uh, been um, uh, showing. So in, in that respect, uh, a special regime of temporary protection has been activated, which is in, in, a, uh, in a nutshell is based on a group determination, acknowledgement that these persons who are living from Ukraine, they need protection, they cannot be repatriated and they should be allowed to stay on a temporary basis in the uh, states that they manage to reach. Now, this is a very different uh, regime, uh, quite a privileged regime if you compare with international law regime established by the uh, UN uh, Refugee Convention, because it, for instance, gives uh, access to certain rights still uh, while the person of the, uh, the status of the person is not certain, for example, the right to employment, which is uh, particularly important when we speak about the long term integration should should such uh, be needed. Now, the approach of the Baltic states into which uh, groups of Ukrainian um, or people living from Ukraine uh, need to be protected has been different. For example, Latvia has, has expanded it to people also who stayed in Latvia before the war, uh, Estonia and, and uh, Lithuania. Uh, uh, used uh, the definition in, in the temporary uh, protection uh, uh, directive and, and uh, subsequent uh, council decision. Uh, and for example, students are not covered. Uh, Ukrainian students who have been studying in, in uh, Lithuania are not covered. So this also poses a number of challenges, but uh, I, I will not uh, really go into detail in, in that respect. Now, a second aspect which is uh, important when we look at um, uh, parallels between both Baltic and, and Ukrainian uh, refugees then and now. Uh, uh, what was uh, common was the fact that both Baltic refugees, when they were staying in, in uh, displaced persons camp, camps and also Ukrainian refugees, all of them uh, consider that they are in a temporary situation. Now, in, in the Baltic refugees case, um, uh, of course, uh, the causes for their departure were quite different, although uh, clearly a number of people also left just because of the conflict situation, not because of, of persecution. But um, this is very different from uh, the Ukrainian situation, uh, people who live because of the war. So the solutions for both of the groups might also differ, while for the Baltic refugees, a durable solution was needed. So they were resettled and uh, granted uh, uh, residence, uh, permanent residence in, in uh, uh, those countries that accepted them. While um, uh, for Ukrainian refugees, of course, uh, we very much hope that um, uh, once the Ukrainian uh, war uh, is, is ending, they will be able to uh, repatriate and, and, and go uh, back uh, uh, home. So uh, therefore, uh, the uh, nature and type of protection, even uh, irrespective of, of the legal, uh, let's say, uh, situation at international law at, at that moment, uh, is uh, already quite different. Now, what was uh, quite similar was the solidarity approach that we have seen uh, in uh, those countries that have been receiving either on temporary basis firstly and, and then on a permanent basis, the, the Baltic refugees. Uh, the same we see with the Ukrainian refugees uh, uh, here in, in Europe, uh, solidarity without, without any conditions. Um, now, um, this is uh, something that um, uh, distinguishes uh, also uh, Ukrainian uh, refugees and also at that time the Baltic refugees from, from the others. Um, uh, for instance, uh, in the 1940s, Lithuania ho also hosted uh, uh, refugees, uh, were around 27,000, not that uh, few uh, refugees that were fleeing the Nazi regime from, from Poland. And indeed, there were a number of challenges. Uh, hosting and, and uh, receiving those refugees in Lithuania. In present times, um, uh, the Baltic states are also hosting refugees from other conflicts. And we see that there is not so much support as, as for Ukrainian uh, refugees. Now, clearly, um, uh, this uh, uh, welcomed approach and solidarity approach is, is triggered 
partially uh, due to perception of a common threat, uh, threat that um, threat to security vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Russia. So refugees are seen as allies, of course, uh, exposed to this threat that also the, the Baltic states are experiencing. But there is, of course, not a similar connection to uh, those far away, let's say, conflicts in Syria or Afghanistan, uh, which generate also refugees in the Baltic uh, countries. Uh, so they are treated less fair favorably and uh, this we could see both uh, by the society but also with regard to the scope of rights and the and the last uh, point about the approaches that i would like to highlight is uh, maybe for, for sake of interest that most of the resettlement schemes uh, that operated in in uh, uh, the case of baltic refugees uh, in the world war ii uh, though they are uh, they were based actually on the labor migration scheme so more on traditional immigration let's say channels uh, plus uh, certain countries like uk canada required sponsorships now uh, of course it is based on on legal obligations and, and also humanitarian reasons as a result of developments of international law throughout those 70 years so uh, I will further move to, to the challenges and just highlight a few of them uh, uh, because of, of the time uh, pressure and we are already behind the schedule. So with regard to the challenges, uh, two points uh, that I would like uh, uh, to make and those uh, points of course are very relevant for integration, uh, be uh, Ukrainian refugees or, or will the Ukrainian refugees need for, uh, to stay for shorter or for, for longer, the uh, aspects of integration are important important from the very uh, very first day uh, that refugees arrive. So the first uh, two points uh, related to integration is uh, accommodation and uh, uh, access to employment. Now, if we look back to the Baltic refugees, they were all hosted in, in reception camps for displaced persons. Now, if we look at uh, 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 Ukrainian refugees, it was quite clear from the very beginning that um, uh, the state resources will be insufficient uh, for adequately housing and protecting the high number of refugees coming from Ukraine. Now, the response uh, then was primarily uh, taking place on a local um, uh, basis involving, involving the spontaneous initiatives of members of the society that were active both individually but also through various platforms that existed um, uh, in, in the three Baltic countries. And I must say that this tendency was not just the tendency of the Baltic countries, the same we observed in Poland, but also in, in Southern and, and Western Europe, for example, in Spain and some other countries. Now, this uh, type of solution is, is something new in, in the refugee protection uh, nowadays. Uh, we have seen a little bit of this during the uh, war in former Yugoslavia and its consequences uh, with uh, refugee flows, but this is something quite uh, quite unique for, uh, for uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, flow of, of refugees. Now, it, it also might uh, pose certain challenges if uh, this um, solution needs to be sustained for a longer period of time. And of course, I will not uh, talk because I, I hope it will not happen about the usual fatigues that come with conflicts, uh, freezing of conflicts for, for a certain time. I hope this will not uh, happen because I hope this conflict will, will finish uh, soon. The second uh, point that is important for integration is of course access to employment. And um, uh, this is something that is in short in, in, in Baltic states as in many other European Union states. Uh, now, uh, the difference between the Baltic refugees of that time and, and the 40s uh, was quite different if we look at the, the demographic composition of those uh, refugees because these were families, these were not uh, mostly women and children as we see with the uh, Ukrainian case law. And, and what difference it makes, it makes really difference for the access to the labor market. On one hand, the Ukrainian uh, refugees, they have a number of characteristics that facilitate their access to the labor market because uh, firstly, due to the temporary protection, they have direct access uh, without waiting for any kind of bureaucratic procedures related to the legal status, but uh, also because of, of uh, language, because of, of some social ties, some uh, cultural ties with Ukraine, uh, uh, some community uh, based in, in the Baltic uh, countries and so on. On the other hand, as these are mostly women and children, of course, uh, there is a need for uh, uh, special support for child care in order for them to, to engage in, in uh, employment. So uh, last but not least, with regard to long-term solutions, this is uh, uh, again uh, 
was quite clear for the Baltic refugees because they could not return for a long time, so they were resettled. But for uh, Ukrainian refugees, the situation is still uh, quite unpredictable until when this protection will be needed. Now, temporary protection is, is legally uh, valid for maximum of two years, and uh, what uh, it will be afterwards is, is really not, not clear, unless it's clear that uh, if needed, then asylum channels would need to be used on an individual basis, but let's hope that this will not uh, be uh, needed. So just a few highlights on the channel challenges, and let me uh, to conclude um, by, by saying that firstly, um, uh, the international uh, uh, agreements uh, uh, have been actually developed uh, again as, as a basis, and, and I think that the Baltic uh, uh, refugee situation also contributed to the international uh, community acknowledgement of the need for more permanent uh, uh, protection of, of refugees through certain international instruments and also acknowledgement that there could be groups uh, of refugees that could not be repatriated. But at that time it was ad hoc agreements and now we find it uh, uh, well established uh, non-repatriation or so-called principle of non refoulement is well established in international law in the refugee convention. It's part of, of the customary law, but at the moment it has been of little uh, use uh, to uh, Ukrainian uh, refugees uh, due to uh, the fact that uh, they enjoy a special uh, treatment uh, through activated temporary protection uh, regime. Um, uh, Again, the, the uh, uh, solutions for the Baltic refugees and, and Ukrainian refugees uh, uh, as uh, the nature of uh, uh, conflict and uh, the solutions will be uh, different. Uh, while the Baltic refugees faced persecution and, and similar threats that, uh, that uh, warranted their resettlement for permanent basis uh, to other countries. Now, in, in case of Ukrainian refugees, uh, there is a, a, a hope, but also the, from the legal perspective, they will be able to, uh, to return to Ukraine uh, once the war uh, ends, because the, the nature of, of the, their uh, uh, departure from the country is, is related to the uh, to the war. And secondly, uh, the uh, uh, it's it's quite uh, clear that uh, uh, those experiences that uh, uh, were with Baltic refugees ended up uh, with final uh, finally uh, formulation of uh, stronger basis uh, in international law vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the ad hoc agreements and ad hoc policies of the states through international instruments while um, uh, with regard to Ukrainian refugees it is already uh, quite clear that um, Ex these experiences with the uh, reception of uh, Ukrainian refugees in the Baltic states in particular uh, will be very instrumental in building the preparedness uh, for other uh, refugee influxes, mass influxes, influxes uh, in these countries. I think it's, it's also quite un unavoidable nowadays. Although I must also admit that uh, these experiences are really very fresh, very new, and of course they need to be uh, analyzed in more details in order to come to uh, more, um, uh, more precise uh, conclusions. So this is where I would like to end, even though of course the topic is, is uh, very huge and, and I hope that through the discussion we will also be able to touch basis on, on some other aspects that have not been covered. Yeah, many thanks, uh, Professor Yakulevici, and uh, this was uh, uh, extremely uh, also useful and, and complete uh, within a short time that uh, you had and all of the other speakers uh, uh, had. Um, I'm very pleased that we managed to go, uh, you know, uh, across all of the, uh, in fact, relevant uh, uh, concepts uh, uh, in international law that are, you know, uh, un uh, helping us to understand um, the war uh, um, and the consequences uh, of the war that uh, Russia has uh, waged uh, against Ukraine. We have just a few minutes left. Uh, I will do uh, three uh, things. First, there was a comment uh, by Professor Vadapalas uh, within the, the, the first panel. I understood that Professor Vadapalas wanted to uh, sort of add something or, or 
somehow <laughs> redirect something. Second, uh, I have uh, one question uh, already pending from uh, uh, the uh, audience. There are more, but I will be able to take uh, one question. I will direct that question to Professor Jalimus. And the question is, and there will be a moment to prepare, uh, what would the tribunal do? Uh, what would the tribunal achieve? I mean, the tribunals in the past have not really achieved much. If we talk about, for example, uh, war tribunals, so that's the question we will address. And finally, I will give you uh, three brief uh, uh, um, sort of summing ups of uh, uh, where we are. So, Professor Vadepalas, you first. Thank you very much, Judge. Professor Zemini. Uh, well, about uh, tribunals, I'm not so sure because uh, we shall not forget the case law of uh, American and uh, French uh, military tribunals uh, after 1945. Secondly, we, I'm convinced, uh, I'm sure, that in the future we will see uh, so many uh, cases in the national courts, in the international courts, um, many real problems concerning um, damages, damages, claims, and so on. And the, the topics that today we have uh, dealt with uh, will be very important from a practical point of view. Uh, finally, I would like to say that in uh, litigation, if you have a um, case of responsibility, damages and so on, both parties uh, invoke uh, very often the circumstances excluding uh, responsibility. For example, very simple, very simple, the consent, uh, consent of a victim. Secondly, necessity. In criminal cases, uh, of course, self-defense, and uh, so on and so on. So uh, practical aspects we will see, I'm sure, for destinies for many, many years in the future, even after, I hope, the peace treaty after victory of Ukraine will be concluded, we will see many many cases of litigation concerning war in Ukraine and uh, aggression against Ukraine and the consequences against this aggression. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, uh, Professor Vatepalas. Uh, Professor Ralimas, please, the question. Uh, thank you. you know, uh, what can it, it, it achieve? Yeah. Yeah, th thank you very much for the, uh, for this question. And in addition, we received one more question, I think, uh, which is also a little bit along the uh, same lines. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. along the same lines. Mm -hmm. So uh, first, uh, first of all, uh, I'm sorry, but I cannot agree with uh, the idea that the tribunals haven't achieved much. Uh, really, they uh, did achieve uh, a lot uh, in. Uh, First of all, evaluating all the crimes and ensuring uh, uh, that uh, no impunity uh, should be for uh, international crimes. And uh, but I'm not uh, here um, uh, talking about uh, all the tribunals, including, for example, uh, the tribunal which was referred to former Yugoslavia. But first of all, I am recalling N Nuremberg. Uh, so uh, I think. Uh, uh, the fact that Nazi ideology uh, has been condemned uh, and uh, I know nobody can now openly uh, present Nazi arguments in pursuing uh, any national or international policies in, in justifying any crimes, it is due to the Nuremberg Tribunal. So actually what I am arguing for uh, that is to establish a tribunal that would be very similar to an, like Nuremberg II tribunal uh, that uh, first of all uh, uh, would uh, condemn, assess and condemn uh, the ideology which is very similar to the Nazi ideology that is so the Russian world. It's the ideology of the Russian world and it is vital for 
you know, for the future of the Baltic states. Because once this ideology is not condemned, nobody can assure. Uh, I mean, condemned on the international level, not between us, but on, on the level of the highest possible judicial level, um, uh, then nobody can assure uh, the long let's say, standing guarantees for the Baltic state, because the ideology of the Russian world or the Russianism, it clearly includes the Baltic states as a part of the Russian world. Uh, and Russia feels to be entitled to our territory, uh, maybe, at any cost, I mean, even with exterminating of our people. And I, I'm not naive, you know, uh, to expect that without uh, proper assessment of this ideology, um, uh, anybody can guarantee that this will not happen again. And um, uh, I, I, I already uh, presented the possible modes to establish this kind of tribunal. And uh, uh, now I'm answering a little bit to, uh, to the second question uh, we received. Uh, that is about the UN Security Council. Uh, of course, in, in the current circumstances, uh, we all understand that uh, this issue cannot be solved by means of the resolution of the UN Security Council. That's why, uh, you know, the main possible mode and uh, it is also expressed by the Council of Europe and in Parliamentary Assembly Resolution, first of all, that is the treaty, multilateral treaty, with participation of Ukraine, of course, with participation of major uh, Western powers and, uh, in general, democratic uh, community of states. Uh, that is a multilateral treaty establishing the special tribunal. And uh, uh, one more thing, of course, um, we, of course, uh, uh, can persecute aggression on the basis of universal jurisdiction, but unfortunately, uh, usually, uh, in this case, uh, uh, if we speak about national universal jurisdiction, uh, immunity is recognized uh, to the heads of states, uh, and uh, I think uh, that is one more argument why we really need international tribunal uh, with no immunity. Uh, for uh, such crime as uh, aggression, even for the heads of the state. So that, that is possible only by concluding a special uh, treaty on this issue. So I hope I answered, so thank you very much. Um, yes, many thanks uh, indeed. Uh, you did answer and I can only uh, second, uh, I mean, how the, the tribunal can be uh, established and there are practices in the history uh, of, uh, of uh, humanity to go through the intergovernmental conferences. Now, uh, uh, unfortunately, I have to head towards uh, closing our seminar. Um, I would like to highlight uh, three more main points. Now, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the panelists, all the colleagues from all three Baltic states uh, and all th of the members of the editorial board uh, of the Baltic Yearbook uh, of International Law and the Riga Graduate School of Law. With this seminar, uh, Riga Graduate School of Law starts its uh, research week. And I think it is a good uh, start uh, for research. And we see how important in legal uh, legal science the research is and how important in international law is to uh, study, compare, uh, draw on experiences uh, um, and come to the conclusions on very complex uh, matters. Now the first uh, point I would like to make, uh, uh, the main question we asked or the underlying question was how effective really is international law to deal with such crises? And part of the answer to that question that comes out from your research and analysis that you presented today is the following, that we conceptualize all of these facts and events uh, that characterize uh, Russia's uh, uh, aggression uh, today, we, uh, we characterize them, we conceptualize them in terms of rules and concepts that international law offers. And we have seen that international law in 1938 and 1940 in different regards actually was not as complete as it is uh, today. It has clearly uh, uh, consolidated 
into uh, a more complete international legal system and we can explain uh, the violations and the misbehaviors in terms of law. And that is actually uh, an achievement and a very important paradigm for uh, the humanity. Now, the second point I would like uh, to make, um, indeed, uh, I agree uh, with Professor Jalimus very much so, that if we manage together to bring justice to Ukraine and the Ukrainian people, it does assist the Baltic people to deal with their own wounds, uh, with uh, the matters that have not been solved since the occupation. And so to answer the questions uh, from the audience, I should say impunity if it is not dealt with, will continue to perpetuate new crimes. And we have seen that because the Russian Federation did not pay for the crimes it committed uh, during World War II and afterwards, and certainly in the Baltic states, you can see that new crimes are being uh, 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 conceived and in fact carried out. So it is therefore that using all the mechanisms, all the experiences and ideas we have, the peace loving states have to do uh, their utmost to counter impunity. That is my answer to uh, uh, the questions. And finally, uh, I would like to inform all of those that the speakers of today's seminar will be publishing uh, their uh, thoughts and their analysis in the form of final articles in the next volume of the Baltic Yearbook of International Law. And as you can already see, that will be certainly uh, a very important volume and something that will stay in the history of uh, international law. Uh, modern history of international law, the modern doctrine of international law as our contribution to uh, its uh, development and consolidation. And with that, uh, I really uh, would like to uh, thank uh, everybody and uh, to wish you um, uh, a productive uh, day uh, and, a, and a success uh, in all your uh, endeavors. Many thanks on behalf of the Baltic Yearbook and of the Riga Graduate School of Law and have a wonderful day. Thank you very much.